everybody yeah, but gal- me. Yep. Gallery would work best. Yes, that's what I've done. It is now in gallery mode, and we can start the show. As soon as Charles is done scooting around in his chair. News, ops, and a little bit of paranoia. Welcome to the Iron Sisson in Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to tonight's episode of the Iron Sisson in Podcast. I'm your host, Nate, and I'm joined by Jason and Charles tonight. So say chicken. 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 Yes. <laughs> hey, man, we do what we're told. Indeed. Okay. So, um, People may notice we're not going live tonight, but uh, if you missed the live show and you're jonesing for a video, we're going to try to publish this on YouTube later, Uh, just because things have been crazy and, um, well, I didn't feel like setting up the live stream tonight. So, um, we don't usually get a lot of participation anyway, though. What do you guys think? I try not to. It hurts. Okay. Well, that's valid. So, uh, here we are on episode 69. Um... Well, we, should we make a joke about that, or is that a poor taste? I, I think you just did. <laughs> I mean, it could be a nice joke, but it would be kind of in poor taste. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, some of us have been busy, very busy, changing jobs. Um, again, I feel like I have to apologize to Charles. But Some of us have been very busy um, dealing with the consequences of that person changing <laughs> jobs. But, you know, whatever. Hey, so you know, you, life sucks. You folks may have noticed that we did not release an episode two weeks ago when we should have. That would have been the first episode for, um, what month is this again? October. And uh, that's because I had a very busy week. Uh, I was in North Carolina for two days for new hire orientation at Red Hat. And then on that Thursday, which we should have recorded the show, I was in New York City. So I was like all over the eastern side of the U.S. um, two weeks ago. So uh, yeah, we just didn't have time. Couldn't get a show in on Thursday, and I didn't want to go through the effort of trying to schedule a show for some other night, because that bothers my co-hosts, right? We don't it's, react well to that. It's just I'm, I'm usually bothered in general. So. It's just Well, yeah, you are, but that's fine. <clears throat> so uh, uh, anyone that's watching the, the video, you, you may notice the awesome backgrounds that both Charles and Jason have put up behind them. <laughs> All because we were fiddling with Zoom. You're just jealous that yours doesn't work. Yeah, mine doesn't work right. Just it just doesn't. And um, I could demonstrate that if you guys want to see on the sh- on the thing. But you audio listeners, uh, you're not going to really care that much. So well, you know. as they but as they say on the shutdown full cast, podcasting is a visual medium. Indeed. So there you go. If your anybody is watching, your you can, red hat is prominent. Yes, the. The red hat hanging on the wall, um, some of the background of my Doom poster, and the door behind me show up. My face, on the other hand, does not. (laughs) It's awesome. So we're going to turn that back off. Um, But yeah, that's using the virtual background settings in Zoom, which is what we use to record. So, you know, you can also see a funny halo around uh, Jason's head. Because of his head. Yeah, well, because of your possibly be right. No, it's because of your headset. You can see the pink wall just barely through the one side of your headset. You can see, yeah. Oh, I suppose <laughs> he didn't even tell me it's not pink. He's given up. I, you know, there used to be so so there used to be. I don't even know if it's here anymore. There used to be a setting. So, uh, in what's that stupid chat app? Snapchat. Um, okay yeah oh it's here i found it you can touch up uh, let's see if it does it make a difference it doesn't make it much of a difference with me but uh there's a touch up your appearance button you can press as well which smooths the i don't know whatever okay touch up my appearance oh yeah. look now i look fake you now look i look grainy before. what do you mean okay i'm not a I robot <laughs> what <laughs> Anyway. Okay, okay, virtual Nate, let's move on. <laughs> I am not a robot. So, at any rate, um, 
yeah, we thought we would talk tonight a little bit about uh, both leaving jobs and starting jobs. Um, our last episode was about when to leave a job. So I guess, uh, you know, as- assuming you've made that choice or the choice has been made for you, as one of our co-hosts gets frequently. Um, I don't you know, know just talking about. Just, just basic, uh, we're, we're going to chat a bit about uh, when you're about to leave a job, maybe things you could do uh, when you're about to leave a job, not of your own choice, things you might want to do <laughs> other, other than kick your old boss in the shins. Um, and then uh, starting a new job, basically, uh, you know, what, what to expect. I mean, obviously every job is going to be different, but things you should not get blindsided by. So. Um, for me, I've only left a couple jobs and I've only left them on good terms. And only two of them were jobs where I really had to do anything to make sure that there would be continuity after I left. Um, so that's one thing I've always focused on when leaving a job, uh, that the people I'm leaving behind will have something, um, be that documentation or be that whatever, um, to help to help carry on doing whatever I was doing. So Charles, maybe you can speak to that being the person who's left in the rubble after I left. (laughs) Has it been okay? Well, well, you Uh know, it's interesting because now I've been on both sides of this. You know, I was the one walking away at my previous job and now I'm the one left behind. Um, Yeah. Documentation only gets you so far. Sure. Nothing is going to replace just having like a, deep sense of how a particular platform works. So like Nginx Plus, we, as you may have guessed from some of the things we asked you, we discovered very quickly, you know, that there were just things about it, about its operation, in particular with new capabilities that we just didn't understand. And that's been a learning curve and we're dealing with it. I hope nothing's uh, been, been burnt to the ground because of it. <laughs> the one outage that happened would have happened anyway. Oh and no! It the same, and it was the same usual screw up mm. with um, DNS being done, changed at the wrong time. So that's nothing to do with you. That would have broken even if you'd still been here. Uh, I, you know, unless I caught it, which let's be honest, I probably wouldn't have. The change <laughs> in question was pushed directly to master without review, so you probably wouldn't have. Oh yeah, that'll do it. There's been a discussion, and that probably won't happen again. I mean, I but, I never I never pushed my changes to master. There, I mean, there, there may be controls you can put in place to prevent that sort of thing. I'm thinking there could about be. it. There could be. So, uh, but, hey. You know, but yeah, main idea, just, it's, yeah. Jason, you, you yeah. may want to look out behind you. <laughs> you know, we did. It's a young woman with a sword. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we did a lot in the run-up to, you know, we thought we asked all the right questions and got a lot of things written down, but in the yeah. end, you don't necessarily know what's going to break. Well, so I mean, from you, from yeah, from both sides of this, right? Like, I I tried my best, but face mm-hmm. it, I was there ten and a half years. There were a lot of things that I touched, and a lot of things that I probably took for granted that other people understood, and maybe they didn't, because you know I was the one everybody came to to do those things, and I just you know had thought that either through documentation or through exposure to them that other people already knew how to do these things, but that may not be the case. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's, that's generally, you know, and, and I generally try not to burn bridges when I leave a place. Um, even if I'm in a situation where maybe there's uh, either some bad blood or, or someone I may have been trying to get away from, you know, like when I left the place I, w- I was at before the college, um, I was not very happy there because the place, it was managed poorly. The guy that ran the place was really kind of a jackass. I've talked about him before on the show. And, um, you know, I was definitely pleased to leave there. But even still, I left there on the best terms I could manage. Um, and that's always, I think that's always a good way to go about things. Um, I don't know. Jason, have you ever flipped a table and walked out the door? I know you've, you've probably been close to it. Um, <laughs> have I flipped the table and walked out the door? Not in a professional setting. Um, 
I've gotten I've gotten really close and I've threatened it and I've talked to managers and and whatever you want to call the above the managers. Um, and in in most in most of those cases, weirdly enough, so so look, I, I have a I have a history. <clears throat> um, <laughs> no. jobs tend to leave me and I don't tend to leave jobs. Um, that said, I do make my grievances known and they are, I would say they are actually received mostly um, in good faith and then there's people that try to deal with them. Um, and for the most part, I've had good luck with going to higher ups and saying, you know, th this is, this is just a screwed up situation and, and this needs to change or th these things are a problem or whatever. And, and I've gotten what appears to be good feedback on it and, and dealt with it. Um, my, my leaving tends to be um, sort of a breaking point where I, I kind of shut down and, and won't really deal with, with what's going on anymore. Cause I've just, uh, at some point the stress becomes too high and I don't have the uh, the emotional capital to deal with it anymore, um, and and you know they just don't react well to that. Um, but in most cases, they they will try to address it, and in some cases that it, that you know them addressing it is well, suck it up, we won't do it that way, or this is the way it is, deal with it. Um, or you're fired. Case, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, um, I've never been outright fired for that sort of thing. Yeah. It usually ends up being well. No, I guess going going to your management and saying this is a problem would be a very bad time for them to fire you. Um, I mean, I surprisingly, like I've gone in a lot of times, like full of full of uh, you know, fire and brimstone, and ready to just you know, like burn the bridge and walk away. And surprisingly, they they don't. Um, and every by you know, usually. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they turned around and said, well, you know, that's too bad. Have a nice life. Yeah. Hmm. Well, so I guess, um, you know, leaving on good standing is one thing. And that's kind of what I've, I've been alluding to. Um, your, your, your uh, uh, description there has led us into the next talking point that I had outlined, which is when you're leaving on not such good standing. Um, and I don't know that there's really a whole lot that you can do there because usually that's a, that's a surprise. Or maybe not a surprise. Maybe it's a thing you can expect, but you don't know when. Like, it's not a thing you can easily plan for, right? Getting summarily fired? No. Yeah. Well, I would say in some cases, yes, you can. Um, so my departure from um, the first place we both worked was not actually very surprising. Um, and how much you want to talk about this? So basically I had, there was I a had, lawsuit involved afterwards. So yes, be careful. <laughs> not that kind of lawsuit. Uh, no, right. So, right. so, so there were things that were happening that I felt were immoral. Um, definitely not good business. And and to be quite honest, getting fired was probably the best thing that happened to me there. Yeah, it's kind of how um, I felt uh, when I left that web host I was talking about. Yeah, it, it felt yeah. very. It I mean, it felt like I was working for a used car salesman, and that's because he was. Yeah, yeah. It, it it was, it was a company that had the money to do um, full blown marketing, and was yeah. marketing absolutely one hundred percent false statements. Yeah, and. I had a problem with that and I called them on it multiple Can't imagine times. Why. Um, and so when, when I was finally marched in and fired, um, I, if I remember correctly, I actually laughed at them um, because I found it humorous. <laughs> uh, so there was laughing and yelling involved because, yeah. you know, and, because and it's you, you know, it is because it's me and, and to my, to my, to my credit, I guess. Um, so this went through, I, I filed for unemployment all nine yards. Um, they brought um, the big guns. There were, uh, there was a CTO, two VPs, a director, and a high-powered lawyer who showed up 
um, and I had my hundred dollar lawyer, and I won. So there was a they were they were damn sure they were not going to pay you unemployment. Is that what that was? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, and it took a lot. It took me four months, five months. Wow. Of not getting of not getting paid at all. Yeah, um, unemployment that kind of sucks. Even, it was really weird. Unemployment wasn't even paying anything. Um, and then I won and and got a lump sum and and walked away. So. So, I mean, look, it's not something I would recommend. Yeah. Um, and, and to be honest, I don't, I don't really go out to try to get fired. Well, no, uh, why would goal. you? I mean, I'm sure there's someone out there that does that, but. I, I get very invested in the companies I'm with, usually. Mm -hmm. um, I get very, very invested in the companies I'm with. I know the feeling. I will, I will fight tooth and nail for the right thing for the company. and. I end up, uh, I end up being on the wrong side of whatever the politics in the company wants, um, and I will argue till I'm blue in the face that in every situation I've been right. Well, of and course you that's, were. Maybe that's hubris. Maybe that's just my ego. I don't know, but um, I don't think oh. I don't think necessarily that I've done anything necessarily wrong. But I Good. move on and and. So be it. That to be, there is something to be said for recognizing that sometimes you might be right, but it would be the wrong thing to push for it. Yeah, Just, no, I, I'm, I, there's absolutely times that I'm wrong, right? So when I, the, the couple of times I've been in a hiring position, um, one of the things that I tell people that come in, um, actually when I've, in fact, for the job that I interviewed for and got this time, one of the things that I push really hard is like, I like to argue. I like to have arguments about technology and about what we're doing and, and you know, what the right thing is. Um, and I will argue vehemently for a position that I believe in. But if I'm wrong and you can show me that I'm wrong, I'll back off immediately. And, and I, will, I will concede the point with no problem. Um, I'm not. I'm not the type of person who's who's going to push. Even though I know I'm wrong, I'm not going to push forward. I'm going to say, "Oh, you know, you're right," and I, and I've done it. I mean, I think Nate's seen it. I, you've probably seen it too, Charles. Like I, I've, I've done it before. Seen it. So, so I, I'm not. I'm not the type of person that's that's you know, pushing for things that don't exist just because I can't be wrong. Um, but I, you know, I, I may be a little bit too passionate sometimes. No. I don't know what you're talking about. That's not me the neither. Jason I know. Nope, me neither. It's it's all for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, that got really interesting when you moved your head back. Your your virtual background now includes your uh, your pop filter. Oh, now it's gone. <laughs> oh, that's that pretty neat. <laughs> it thought that was your face. <laughs> Apparently. So. Um, so I guess once you've left a job, right? And uh, obviously the goal, I hope, would be to find another one. Um, starting a new job, at least in technology, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, I mean, Jason, you've, again, been through this maybe more frequently, more frequently than me, but I've been through it just recently. So um, a couple points I'd like to make to anyone who's either starting a brand new job because, you know, they've never had a job before, you know, they're new to, new to, new to working, um, or if transitioning from one job to another, maybe after having been at a job for a very long time, um, like I was, uh, it's okay to feel like you're really overwhelmed because at the moment I feel a bit overwhelmed <laughs> because, uh, starting at Red Hat, there's just a whole bunch that I need to get up to speed on. And it's not necessarily my technical skills because they hired me because I had technical skills. Uh, but it's more or less just the culture there and the way I'm supposed to do the job I was hired for and the procedures and the protocols that are supposed to be followed. And, you know, this is how you deal with customers and this is how you uh, handle your, your tickets. And, you know, this is all the systems you need access to. And you know, there's just a ton of little things that have to happen. And um, again, it's certainly not for lack of technical uh, ability because obviously that hasn't changed since I left the college. Um, it's just, you know, getting acclimated with the, with the new place. 
Um, I remember feeling a similar thing when I started at the college. Um, I want to say that was almost worse because when I started at the college, I had a lot less experience under my belt and I really got sort of thrust into some of the more technical things uh, because the guy we were working for probably recognized that I could handle it and maybe I just didn't know it yet. Now you're soaring above a valley or something. Okay. So, uh, too much fun. Yeah. <laughs> your virtual... Notice Charles hasn't changed his ones. He's happy with his train tracks in the background. <laughs> this photo is fantastic. Why it is. It? It's awesome. Why would you want the, the, the photo I chose is great too. <laughs> Mine's interactive. I can go do things. Again, more. podcasting. It's a visual <laughs> medium. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I mean, any any comments to make on that I, from either of you, Charles or or Jason? Yeah, um, I had a similar feeling. Um, I started at the college. It's been seven and a half years now, um, because I was for one, th you know, a couple things were changing. I I'd moved from Michigan to Pennsylvania. I'd lived in Michigan my whole life, and I'd certainly seen other parts of the world. But you know, uprooting. I'd lived in the same city for ten mm -hmm. years. Just it was in some ways it was something of a break and having to sort of reestablish my life. Um, I had a lot going on at the time. Uh, and I was coming out of this mixed desktop engineer, web developer role and being a pure web developer, later web developer system in kind of role. And I was also shifting from working what was primarily a window shop at a somewhat smaller institution to Lafayette, which had a pretty thorough, well-established um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux shop. Uh, I had Linux experience, but it was mostly Debian derivatives. So there was, it was a learning curve. And I almost felt like, oh crap, I gotta learn how to walk again. Like I'm smart, right? I'm experienced, I know how to do things, but I don't know how to do them the way they're done here. And I right. had to figure all that out and figure out how, who all these new coworkers are and what the politics of the institution are, what the politics of the division are. You know, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot. And for a long time, I felt a little bit at sea. And then gradually, you know, things got easier, more routine. And I started to feel more comfortable. And pretty soon, I felt confident enough to start you know, kind of coming up with, well, now this is the way I do things. And maybe, you know, let's see, um, you know, getting people to maybe come see it my way and start take, doing things the way I want to do them. Yeah, and that's, and that's a valid thing to keep in mind, that you don't necessarily have to 100% mold into what it is that everyone around you is doing. They hired you because they like you and your abilities, whatever job you're, you're applying for or you've been hired for, um, but that doesn't mean you have to do it their way. It means you have to get along with the team. It means you have to do it in a way that is not going to, you know, cost trouble or whatever, but you bring a unique skill set and unique attitude and a unique view viewpoint to everything that you're about to work on. So, And any reasonable workplace, you know, say when they hire you, they assume that you can do the job, but they're also assuming that there's going to be some unique thing you bring that makes the organization better in some way. Right. Maybe they have an idea of what that's going to be and well, maybe they don't. Right. But, and they'll be watching for that. And, you know, if it's a good organization, they'll encourage you. They'll support you and figure out how to harness whatever that thing it is you do to the organization's benefit. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I, I sort of envy what you're going through right now with Red Hat is you, you've, if I understand correctly, you've basically been in training for three weeks. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, I'm not sure how, well, like, I'm not sure if you appreciate how incredibly rare that is. So, Oh, it is. It is. Um, I, I, I would believe it. And not just that, but the, the way it's, it's structured. So um, I don't know how long, I, I get the feeling that I'm one of the first, at least in my role, to go through this particular um, onboarding procedure. Uh, but they've basically got a number of self-paced learning courses to go through that sort of take the place of me sitting with another Tam learning the ropes. 
maybe not take the place, but they're, they're meant to bring me up to speed so that when I start doing that other thing, you know, where I hang out with another Tam and see how they, they actually execute all this stuff, um, I've already got a good base, which is something I have never had at any job I've ever been at before. And it's yeah, kind of I mean, the, the closest I've gotten uh, is uh, going through the, the standard HR training crap, um, you know, sexual harassment and, and the security awareness, which yeah. has only happened once. Um, you that's, know, that's part of this. In, in fact, just this morning, I started the security awareness stuff that I have to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my, my current position, um, I was there a uh, month and a half, almost two months before they got my access set up so that I could actually do things. And that's not because I was going through training. That's because we couldn't figure out how to get my access set up. Um, that's, that's not, not a good sign. Yeah, it was, it was, it was <laughs> a lot of like, open a ticket, wait, 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 ping the ticket, try to figure out why it's not being done, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of that stuff. And so there's, there was really, and, and I'm still pretty much lost at sea um, with a lot of the stuff that we do because I don't know the systems. I haven't begin, been really given an opportunity to learn the systems. There's a lot of custom code that I have no idea how the hell it works. Um, and this is, this is it. I, I am unbelievably uncomfortable because I am, I mean, you know, we worked at Lafayette and I knew every system in out upside down and backwards. Um, I took pride in knowing every bit that I could about all the systems. Um, yeah to where, you know, you, you're debugging something and I could, you know, chime in and say, well, did you try this or that, you know, and, and we could go right down through the stack and figure out exactly where the problem was. That's, that's what I'm used to here. I'm so lost. You know, they mentioned a system and I'm like, ah, and it's usually an acronym. And then I spend, you know, two minutes trying to figure out what the acronym is. And, I ask. <laughs> and then they, they answer and I'm like, I've never heard of that. Like, yeah, what, that? what is that? Why? Um, so it's, it's, it's frustrating. So, so some jobs, uh, you get some training and they, they sort of lay it out for you. And, and from the other side of that, putting that training together is not easy. Um, I, I had to do that at, at the job I had before this one, and it is not a trivial thing. Um, and trying to bring people up to speed is difficult. Um, so, you know, kudos to Red Hat for, for at least having a, a set of courses you can go through. Yeah. And like I said, I, I don't know that, that, that that's a thing they've always had. I get the feeling that I'm, at, at least in the group that I'm in, I'm one of the first to go through these. Um, they do seem polished enough that either someone's put a lot of work into them or they have, you know, people have gone through them before. So anyway, I'm, I'm, what I'm not trying to say is that Red Hat has everything together and this has been, you know, smooth and puppies and rainbows. Um, I'm saying that I'm surprised at how well, like how well thought out this, it, this particular onboarding course was, uh, or is, I should say, because I'm not even close to done with it yet. <laughs> you know, on the sort of on the other side of that, um, an interesting experience I've had over the last year and a half is that we hired a new developer. And while I'm not a supervisor, it has nevertheless somewhat fallen to me to some training, some mentoring, giving him tasks, building up his capability and figuring out like, okay, because you all have all those same problems. Like you guys, like you guys are talking about systems and I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, you know, what the system is, what it does and, you know, having to have the patience to explain, okay, here's what it does, you know, without overwhelming and respecting that he's trying to get up to speed, but you don't want to overwhelm him uh, right. with information that, He's not ready to hear yet because, you know, eventually you get to the point where you're running and you know everything. Yeah. yeah. But it could take years. You know, if you, <laughs> yeah, it takes years. And if you had it all laid out in front of you ahead of time, you will know all this. That could be terrifying. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like it took me a good three or four years at the college um, before I really got all the various facets of the, 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 the systems that, even even just the ones I was I was responsible for, let alone all the extra knowledge I've I gained over the years about how the network was laid out and how the network gear was configured and whatever, and that was mainly through chatting with uh, with Jason because we commuted together. Um, but by the time I left there, I mean I would say 
and I'm, I'm not trying to like sound like I've got a big head or anything. I don't know that there was any one employee there that had the full picture of that, those systems that I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, but that took 10 and a half years, maybe seven or eight years, you know, cause it wasn't, but you know, I, I knew it pretty well by the time I left, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not the sort of thing you pick up in a day or in a couple of weeks or whatever. So, yeah. I don't know that I'll ever have that clear of a picture of how Red Hat systems are set up. If it, <laughs> it's just such a different scale. Well, and, and it sounds like that's not exactly what your focus is there anyway. No, so no, exactly. That's, have that knowledge. Yeah, it's not my role. And maybe someday it will be. I don't know. It all depends on where things go with Red Hat. Um, it could be that I love being a TAM and that's what I am for the rest of my career at Red Hat. I, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. Do we have any more any more talking points for for starting a job? I mean, other than get up to speed, get comfortable with the people you're working with, and uh, don't don't be afraid to ask a lot of stupid questions because the sooner you ask them, the less chance you'll have of making a stupid mistake. <laughs> yeah, by by all means, ask ask stupid questions and and lots of them. Because if you um, ask the stupid questions when you're only two weeks in, it, they don't look as stupid as when you're three months in. Right, right, and and you know I'm the new guy. Um, only works for a certain period of time, and then it's it's not a valid excuse anymore. I don't know. I knew a certain director who used that that for the first like two years of his employment. So. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So, any other thoughts on this this subject before we move along? I don't know that I had much more to more to chat about. I'll take that as a no. Um, and we what will... you said, I was oh, going to say ahead. what you said about training resonates because certainly I didn't. I've never had training on starting a job. Um, I was sent for training a couple of times in the job before this one. And I had, I've had like spotty bits of training here. Admittedly, I don't really seek it out. Um, and I think that mm -hmm. training packages can be a bit of a mixed bag. I prefer conferences and just kind of learning directly from what other people are doing as yeah. opposed to package training. But uh, I think it's certainly reasonable to consider asking for it when you start a job like, hey, if I'm going to have responsibility for this system, um, is there a training package? Can I be sent for training so I have this baseline level of knowledge so I know what I'm dealing with? And just see. Yeah, I mean, that's... It's, it's an interesting test of your employer to see um, if that's, if they'll say that's reasonable, but we can't afford it. Or if they look at you like you're crazy, that might be indicative yeah. of something. Yeah, yeah. Um... I know that there are some places and some em employees or employers uh, who, before they ever let you touch a technology, they make you go get training on it. You, either whether it be a certification or just a week long class you sit in or whatever it is, you know, they go and they, they, they get you trained um, before you, you even touch the keyboard. But um, there's other places and personally I learn better by doing than I do by sitting in a class. So I mean, there's some people in some places where that either isn't the way they do it or it's not the way that those particular employees learn well. Um, but yeah, it is like if you're that sort of person, then absolutely if you want training uh, before you touch a thing, then ask. <laughs> Just simply ask. Uh, and and I would imagine that some employers may not be interested in in investing that kind of money in a brand new employee until you've shown that you intend to stay or that you have aptitude or, you know, whatever. Or maybe they will, you know. I don't know. Well, it's tough. Are you going to show that kind of commitment or not? That yeah, right. A hard question. Right. Right. So, you know, maybe, maybe it's like, you know, when you're here for 90 days, then we'll send you for training. But then what are you going to do in those 90 days if you don't know what you're working with? You know, mm -hmm. but I, I agree with you on training. I, I always found a lot of value in going to conferences and having those hallway conversations over getting certified and whatnot. Um, as you guys know, cause we've talked about it in the past, I do have a lot of value on practical exams uh, like the RHCE, 
um, because that's the only training I've had where I like legitimately enjoyed the exam. <laughs> so, I, I will, I will absolutely like double down on that. Like RHCE is, is the one certification that actually, if somebody has, I, I'm willing to say like, yeah, um, that person knows what they're talking about. Yeah. They get a little bit of respect just because yeah, that exam and exams like it. I'm not going to say Red Hat's the only one that does practical exams. There are others that do it. I haven't experienced one myself, but I'm sure they're out there. Um, but a practical exam over a written exam, I mean, if it shows that you actually know it, like that's the way to do it. So now, are there any other <laughs> comments? <laughs> <laughs> Or should we, or should we move along into the into the middle middle of the show? Push the button. I'm gonna push the button. Here it goes. Do it. Uh. All right. So in the way of announcements. Um, I guess I guess I can move this from a, from the chat to announcements. So I'll I'll do that then. Uh, so first of all, a quick update on Patreon, um, because I like telling you guys and thanking the folks that are are giving us money via Patreon. Uh, we're making about fifty eight bucks a month currently via Patreon. Our current patrons are Julius, Andy, uh, this guy Jay who happens to be on the show right now, uh, Mark, also Charles who happens to be on the show right now. <laughs> what? 22532, Dementor, and John, which I say this every month, uh, every every week when, when we go over this, Dementor is a guy who reached out to me to talk about PowerShell on Linux. And I keep meaning to contact him to have him on the show. So someday, <laughs> I'm going to get that done. <laughs> and maybe he'll be on the show. <laughs> I do want to say that he didn't have to become a patron to get, his, get, his, get, him on, get himself on the show, but it does remind me every time we do a show uh, since he's in this list. So that'll be a thing. Um, if you'd like to support us via Patreon, please uh, head on over to patreon.com slash iron I think is where that it's. There's a link in the show notes, guys. Go, go look it up. Um, and it was it's very, very uh, helpful um, because it helps us pay for whatever costs are related to the show. And at the moment, there aren't many, although I did improve our hosting environment because we now actually have some income from Patreon. So uh, the the site should be a little more stable now than it used to be. It actually I, I, has. It's a digital digital ocean, right? It is. I have experienced digital ocean now. You have. I have. As as cloud providers go, I like it mainly because it's not, it's not horrible. Well, mainly because it's. I mean, it fits what I what I want. Well, like what I want in a cloud provider is give me a Linux box and I will do things with the Linux box. And DigitalOcean does that and does it cost effectively. Whereas yeah. Amazon and Azure don't want you to run on a cloud Linux box. They want you to run on their services, you know, their, their cloud services, um, not an EC2 instance or not a whatever Azure calls them. Um, so they price them accordingly. Yeah, we, we won't go there with Azure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, I, look, there's nothing wrong with, with Amazon's services um a lot of them are actually quite cool yeah i mean i, I could um, argue with you on that but i won't <laughs> could, but, um yeah DigitalOcean took me all of i i'm pretty sure i set up a box in like 30 seconds oh it's nice and um i looked at running a kubernetes cluster on there because one it's a thing i want to learn what I'm just, I'm, I'm waiting for it. Like I'm waiting for what you're, you're going to say about the Kubernetes cluster. Well, one, it's a thing I want to learn. And two, compared to a similar setup on EC2, it is dirt cheap. Yeah. I mean like 30, 40 bucks a month, you can have a small Kubernetes cluster and they just that, stand no, it up that, for you. 30, 40 bucks is a pretty large Kubernetes cluster there. Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I may actually switch. Uh, so I, I, I built a, Linux box with containers and all sorts of stuff for a uh, client. Yeah. Um, and now that I have everything running in containers, I, I'm I'm considering switching it over to Kubernetes because it'll be half the cost. 
Yeah. So what I what that's essentially what I have now is is a CentOS seven six or seven seven whatever, whatever the latest they have up there is a machine running containers. And why are you shaking your head at me? I can't believe as a Red Hat employee you're not running the latest version. I just I am appalled. How come you're not on eight point oh? It's well they didn't offer it when I built the machine. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> Ooh, is this where I talk about what I had to do to get the AWS tools working on a Rails 6 box? No, because I don't care about your AWS tools. Pip, pip install <laughs> AWS not. CLI? <laughs> hmm? Pip install AWS CLI? Yeah, I did this. I did on this Rails when I was 6? still at the college. Yes, no. on Rails 6. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> not with its default version of Python, you're not. <laughs> Work at any rate, last time I did it. Anyway, at any rate, my goal, <laughs> my goal. You need, you need a sysadmin. Yeah, that's what you need. I had a sysadmin. He rage quit and went to Red Hat. I didn't rage quit. <laughs> that is not a rage quit. You have not seen a rage quit. If you think that was a rage quit, <laughs> I don't think Nate has ever rage quit. No, it's not in me. Um. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, my point is now that it, everything I run on that is containerized. Um. I would like to clean up the containerization that I have set up there, figure out how to do it on Kubernetes and move them into a Kubernetes cluster. So that's the thing I hope to do. And I did talk about that last time we recorded and I still didn't get it done because as I mentioned before, been busy. <laughs> and besides, now that I'm working for Red Hat, it should be on OpenShift, shouldn't it? Instead of Kubernetes? Uh, OpenShift is on Kubernetes, so yeah, I know. sure. But Kubernetes is not OpenShift. No, but OpenShift is nothing without Kubernetes. Indeed. Indeed, you are correct. Anyway. So, yeah, um, the other thing, since we were talking about Patreon when we got sidetracked there, uh, you can also, if you would rather purchase things to help benefit the show, there is a Teespring shop, which is also linked in the show notes, I think, anyway, where you can get things like the T-shirt that I've worn on the show a few times. I think I have, like, a coffee mug up there, stuff like that. Um, not too terribly priced. In order to actually make any kind of profit on these things that would be decent to the show, unfortunately, after Teespring takes their cut, um, you know, you're paying like 20 bucks for a t-shirt to make any kind of decent money. So I'm sorry about that, but it's about as low as I can make it. So unless we can go get like a million t-shirts printed for some dirt cheap price that we can sell for a better price than, um, you know. Anyway, I'm rambling about money. That's a lot that. of t-shirts though. That would be a lot of t-shirts. But if there was enough interest in t-shirts, maybe we could do it that way to make it a little cheaper. But I, I will say the t-shirts look pretty awesome. Yeah, I like mine. And it's also worn pretty well. I've had it for, might be over a year now. Year and a half. And, you know, the lettering's all still nice. It's not like worn off. Um, it's not all cracked like some silk, silk, screen, silk screened t-shirts get. It's actually pretty good quality. The shirt itself is holding up well. I would I would buy it again if I were a repeat customer. I can't speak to the coffee mug though. I didn't buy one of those. Oh, and stickers. There's stickers on there. You can buy stickers. I have stickers. Ours were made by uh, uh, Jedi though. Yeah, yeah. Charles, I have your sticker right here. I was going to leave it on your desk before I left and forgot all about it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you were forgotten before he even left. How does that make you feel? I'm sorry about that. It's well, nice, it's nice to know where I rate in his world. It's, it mainly, <laughs> mainly it's because you were gone and I didn't get to say anything to you the last week I was there, so I forgot all about it. The reason this thing it's is wrinkled. True. I was on a train trip to the Pacific Northwest, which was better than presiding over the dying remains of our uh, stack at Lafayette. Wait, what? Oh, it's the my <laughs> The reason this thing's all wrinkled like this is because it was in my backpack <laughs> to give to you. <laughs> And it got wrinkled because it got stuck under something. <laughs> so anyway, do we have any reviews? I didn't, I forgot to check. <laughs> no, I have not seen any. Um, I'm disappointed. Come on, folks. We need reviews. We need to know what we're doing right, wrong. Tell me I should give, give Charles a sticker, you know, whatever. We're not perfect. We know that. We just, we just we just need you to tell us how we're not perfect. So we you could complain it. about the fact that we didn't record this one live tonight. That'd be something. <laughs> uh, given what a train wreck it is, it's probably best that we didn't. Yeah, um, maybe. Maybe. Given your love for trains, you'd think this would be great for you. Yeah. 
There you go. That's yeah, funny. I'm like using that. the train wreck metaphor. I, you know, I object it. Other people use it, and then here I am. Yep. <laughs> there you are. So the other announcement, which I mentioned I was going to put up here and then didn't, is the DefCon 610 pub crawl, which I am just now pasting into the announcement section of our show notes. So that'll be there when we post the show. Uh, DefCon 610, as you may know, is the DefCon group that I help run, and so is Jason. Uh, we meet in Easton. I, I mean, technically, you're on the you're one of the founder people or whatever. Yeah. Anyway. Um, we meet in Easton, PA, once a month, first Wednesday of the month. Excuse me. And for a very long time, we've been talking, what? I'm trying what? to think of when the next one is. It's next, not next week, the week after. Yeah. Right. Which, unfortunately, I won't be at because I will be in Florida. But anyway, um, we've been talking for quite some time about setting up this neat little idea we had where we're going to run <clears> a pub <throat> Two years. <clears throat> Yeah, it's been like two years. Uh, <laughs> literally, like we formed the group and then we started talking about this would be really cool. We should do that. And then we never did because organizing this kind of a thing has been a little bit of a... Life is hard. Life is hard. Well, organizing organizing a CTF pub crawl, which is what I'm trying to say and I keep, get, keep getting uh, interrupted there. Um, organizing a CTF pub crawl is a lot of work. So what we're running <laughs> on November 16th uh, starting at, I think, 11 a.m. Uh, in downtown Easton is the DEF CON 610 CT, or pub crawl CTF. And what we're going to have is we've got five restaurants slash pubs in Easton that are going to host little Raspberry Pi-based CTF um, flags. And then people are going to be able to go from restaurant to restaurant, hopefully eating, drinking, and being merry, uh, because that's what makes it worth it for the the restaurants. Um, and trying to solve these various uh, CTFs to, or you know, flags to get codes. And there are actually prizes. We we have currently one prize that Danny's put up, a uh, hundred bucks from DefCon Six One Zero. So if you want a hundred bucks and a good time, <laughs> come on out to the DefCon Six One Zero pub crawl. Um, uh, phrasing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, you know, whatever. It's, it's uh, Danny. He's in for it. Yeah. Right. He probably is. So if you go to crawl.defcon610.org, that's defcon spelled out, D-E-F-C-O-N 610.org, uh, you can see some details on our handy dandy little uh, scoreboard, which is just a repurposing of the same scoreboard I've been using for the Hack My Derby contest. Um, by the way, if anyone cares, all of, all of the flags are based on the same architecture we used for the Hack My Derby. <laughs> so it lives on even though DerbyCon is no more and we're sad so if you want to if you want to sponsor it uh let us know and we'll we'll figure out who to get you in touch with yeah absolutely if you want to sponsor a prize or something or if you are a a establishment in downtown easton and would like to participate somehow uh let us know and we'll put you in touch with us and danny <laughs> So that's it for announcements. We have no reviews. No, there's another announcement. Come on now. Well, you didn't put it in announcements. You put it in chat. Oh, did I? Oh, so go on. Sorry. Make your chat announcement. Your chat announcement. I will. I will. I will. So B-Sides Delaware is taking place in two weeks. Uh, November 8-9 in uh, uh, Newcastle, Delaware at the Delaware Technical Community College. Um, so if you're interested, uh, tickets are available online. Uh, it is, uh, if you just search, if you go to Eventbrite and search for B-Sides Delaware, um, it'll pop right up. Um, this is our 10th year, uh, proved to be a lot of fun as it does yes. every year and, uh, come out and join us. It is a good conference and bring your family cause it is definitely family friendly. Yes. Yes. Uh, By the way, sometime between now and when I leave for Florida, I have all of these old electronics here in my basement that I have wanted to give to you to take to spawn camp every year for the past three or four years. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to be able to drive this year. <laughs> okay. Um, we will find a way to stuff them into my car and they will make their way to uh, Delaware again. Good. So we, we definitely need to set that up because every year I say that and every year, def or every year uh, besides Delaware gets here and I'm like, Oh crap, I didn't get that stuff to frizz. 
So we, we got to do, do that. Sure. Yep. Got to get that done. Yep. Okay. On to some somewhat somber news. The three of us um, lost a friend this past week. What was it? Friday? Charles, do you? Monday, I think, was the date that was in yeah, the Yeah, I think Monday. The was it Monday? I'm losing track of days anyway. So Monday. Um, yeah, our friend and, uh, yeah, Monday. Yeah. I've, I've known this guy since I worked at that little web host. Uh, his name was Matt. Um, he came to the, to the college and worked with the three of us there, um, on my reference because he was, he was out of a job after the that little web host had closed up and he worked there for what? Five years, six years. Something like that, yeah. He'd been there a while as our as our network programmer, I think was his official title. Um, and unfortunately, he lost his fight with cancer this uh, this past Monday, and that's sad. I mean, I I guess all of us sort of expected that it was an, a possible outcome. He had a he had it pretty bad, and they caught it pretty late. So usually, that's a pretty bad recipe for uh, a cancer diagnosis. But he fought it for. He fought it for something like a year. I mean, like fought, a year. He fought hard. Yeah, he did, and he went through quite a lot. And it's it's really a shame that it ended this way. But I don't know what else to say other than that his services are soon, and I'm gonna hope I hope to make it to them, maybe Saturday. I think Saturday is his. Uh, there's a visitation on Friday and there's a celebration of life on That's Saturday. That's it. Celebration of life is the word I was looking for in my head and I couldn't find it. So yeah, yeah I, I hope mean, I hope to make I, it to that. I, I, I know we like to keep it fam family friendly here, but uh fuck cancer. So Indeed. Indeed. Too many good people have been struck down. All right, so moving on. Yes, let's move on. So sorry, Matt, that you couldn't be with us anymore. It's a real shame. We miss you. Now I'm going to move your announcement out of chat. Because you're too, too lazy to do it. I'm Mr. Jason building look at oh you can't see what do you but did you what I, I've got toys <sighs> come on we have a show to do I'm participating in the show thank yes you. yes you are all right so on to some news We've got a article from Ars Technica. Alexa and Google Home abused to eavesdrop and fish passwords. So this is a fun little article. Um, I initially, you know, the 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 headlines as they usually are um, is crafted to to catch your eye and think, oh, that that thing that everyone calls an NSA spying device. It totally is. It's it's spying on me. Well, that's not quite what this article is, but um, it is interesting nonetheless. So uh, some security researchers, what did they say? They were in Germany? Uh, let me find it here. I thought they said that. Anyway, they designed uh, eight malicious apps, four for the Alexa and four, or I should say, is it, they call it not the Alexa, the um, Echo, the Amazon Echo. Uh, yes, four Germany. of them. Four of them were for the Echo, and four of them were for the Google Home or Google Nest devices, as they, they're calling them now. They, they've rebranded them to, to Nest. Um, anyway, uh, they're, they, they masquerade as things like horoscope applications. Uh, one of them was a random number generator, which why you'd want to add on an app for your device that is a random number generator when I think they all do that themselves anyway. Um, whatever. They are malicious apps that when you enable them on your device can actually just basically spy on you and listen in and do nasty things with the stuff uh, that they collect. Now, these were security researchers or white hat hackers that created these things. So um, you don't have to worry about, I believe, anyway, 
<clears throat> you wouldn't have to worry about this data actually being used maliciously. The fact that they were able to do it means that other more uh, ill-intentioned folks could have done the same thing. So um, I don't know about you, but I generally don't add any extensions to my, my Google Home devices. Um, and that isn't necessarily because I'm too paranoid about them, but it's mainly because it does everything I need it to right out of the box and I don't really extend it anyway. So I feel like I'm okay, except, you know, it's only Google listening, I'm listening to my stuff. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if you have one of those two devices, you may want to read this article and find out what these apps are and Google, see if you've enabled any of them. <laughs> Google does no evil, so you're okay there. Indeed, um, indeed. This so is why I, I've chosen I, Google for my particular spy of choice. Yeah, what I what I find interesting about this is is um, the the apps were th there's there's a couple of really interesting gotchas in the apps. So uh, first gotcha is uh, these apps, um, at least some of them, the way that they built them, they they respond to the you know like oh, you know Alexa, uh, tell me my horoscope, and right. Alexa will tell you your horoscope. Um, but the kicker on the app is that it never stops listening. So it just sits there and records endlessly. So hmm. I, I know that the the uh, uh, the title of this particular thing is that it's abused to eavesdrop and fish passwords. Um, I don't typically go around my house just announcing my passwords. Yeah. Uh, so it's more so the eavesdropping piece of this. Um, so basically, they're saying like it, apps can be written to just report back everything that's said from now until the end of time. Uh, the other one I think is even more malicious. Um, the, the app would respond and do its thing and you have to tell it to stop. And the act of telling it to stop turns on the recorder. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. And, and so this it, is this is how the hackers think. This is it's great. I love it. Yeah. So I I am curious, and I guess none of us on this show would have an answer to this. But does that mean that if I've created an application or an extension or whatever you call it for a Google Home device or a, a, an Amazon Echo, that I can tell it to send that recorded audio to me instead of to Amazon or Google? Because that's really the only way this would work, right? Um, I bet that information is in here. I would hope. Um, but I think the answer to that is yes, under certain conditions. Um, cause I was always as under the understanding that when I trigger my Google device, uh, the audio, basically all it's doing with that audio is taking it, recording it locally, and then sending it to Google's cloud to analyze it for speech to text, and then returning a command to my device. But this makes me feel like maybe that's not what it's doing. Or maybe that's not all it can do. You know, if it can literally be like, oh, I'm just an open mic listening to everything that you say. I'm also curious if... So, in fact, there's some videos in here. Maybe I'll just watch one of them later. Uh, they're all with the... Uh, well, all the videos are with Echo devices. So, when I... There's, there's the videos I see are both. Electric. Oh, no, there's a Google. There's a Home Mini. Okay. Yeah. I see. There's a Home Mini, then there's a... Okay. Anyway, um, when you trigger a Google device, and I don't know if it's the same thing on Alexa because I, I don't use one myself. Um, when you trigger a Google device and the mic is on, there's a light on top of the thing that's lit that basically says, I'm listening. I'm curious if these malicious apps leave that lit or if they've circumvented that or if that's actually not a, a safety feature like I think it is. They probably are still lit. Most people will ignore it. And it, to answer your question about whether that data is sent, uh, it looks like transcripts are sent. So there, there's, an, there's a certain amount of data that in order for your skill or whatever Google calls it to work, you have to receive data from the, the uh, transcription service to tell mm -hmm. you what it's looking for. Right. That, that data is transcribed from whatever the people say. So you do get a transcription of spoken word. Right. And that, that's, that's what they're which getting could, back. Which is really just as bad as if they have the audio. 
as long as the transcription service works and face it, these yeah, things depend on the transcription service being accurate. So, right. All yeah, right. So, so yeah, guess what? All those, you know, paranoia about your Google and Alexa devices listening to you could be true. Yeah. So I guess I'm going to go smash a lot of objects in my house after I'm done. Yeah. Thermostats, you know, whatever. They didn't, uh, they didn't single out Siri though. Oh, Siri's okay? All right, cool. Keep them on Siri's, Siri's good. <laughs> Siri's good. <laughs> I noticed that oh. Cortana, Cortana is never mentioned anywhere. I didn't. Yeah, right, because no one uses it. I, uh, I didn't include it in oh, the... Boy, in don't the, let Tay hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I didn't include it in the notes because I, well, frankly, I forgot about it when we were trying to get our, our news together. But there was, uh, I think it was last Friday... There was a one of these presentations from Google about their new devices that are coming out in the, the fall and early next year. And one of them, of course, was the Pixel 4. Um, the Pixel 4 has radar. It, yes, radar. I saw you mouthing the word radar. Um, on the front of the phone, like right up where the, the, the self-facing camera would be, the selfie cam, um, there's a chip in there that actually has a, a very tiny radar, right? So that you can do things like wave your hand over the phone to give it commands. So you can literally control your Pixel 4 to do certain things. The example they kept using was skipping songs back and forth, right? Um, just by waving your hand over the thing. Um, I thought it was pretty cool, although it's insane to think that your phone has radar in it. I'm like, that's pretty crazy stuff. Well, I, is it... Is it actually a? Is it actually a radar? I mean, so they like, use the term radar. Face, face <laughs> I don't ID, know. Face ID uses um, infrared to do roughly the same thing. Yeah, no, they they um, called it radar. They yeah, they don't they don't do gestures, but whatever. Maybe they could. Um, you know, they probably could, but yeah, no, I mean that's that's yeah, I, I've seen that. Now I've also seen a lot of um, a lot of. Uh, commentary coming out about how the Pixel 4 is not really all it's cracked up to be as well. So, Well, that's because media I, hates everything. Is it, is it released? <laughs> is it out yet? Or is it still? Uh, you can, I, th I believe there are handsets that you can get your hands on, but I don't think that it's, that it's actually shipping yet. Yeah. I think it's, no, it was late, late October. It might be shipping now. I don't yeah, remember. No, I, I, I just I noticed uh, at least three or four articles come into my my inbox in the past probably a couple of days that were were like you know Pixel Four is kind of not that great, which I thought was surprising. Well, as as with a lot of devices, um, it seems like they focused on a handful of new features and slapped them into a not so revolutionary phone like you know what i mean like apple so, does this too right so incremental updates like every single developer and hardware manufacturer in the world does no so like um i don't know if i have a if i have an accurate example otherwise but i know i mean like, they, they, they they enhanced a couple of features and slapped it in a pixel 3 case right well no no so not they I, I guess, I guess that's that. That's where you're, that's you're you're going the same direction that and, I'm trying. And I'm, I'm but my clearly being facetious with it. Yeah, it no. Wrong. So like, they the the hardware specs and whatnot aren't necessarily much better. And I haven't seen the specs on the Pixel Four, but between like the Pixel One, Two, and Three, this was true. Where it's like they 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 do like a refresh on the phone, but it's not crazily better. The same thing with when Apple comes out with a new device, they call the right, Seven. They, they go from yeah, seven they, to eight. They add a couple nifty, nifty new features, um, release a new version of iOS along with it, and oh, it's a new device. Even though, you know, the the seven and the eight are like practically identical phones. Right. right. The the iPhone eleven has an extra camera and yeah. and a slightly faster CPU, and other right. than that, it's exactly the same as a ten. So with with the Pixel four, I get the feeling that it's sort of like we took the Pixel three, we added radar and some other cool new things. We released and we released our Android nine or. 10 or whatever the latest one is and here's the pixel 4 you know it does so, face, it does like a face unlock thing around right i don't know if it does because because i'm really curious what happens if you put a cover on it i wonder if it does that has the same 
same wonderful Samsung bug. You look confused. Do you not know well, this one? I don't know what it uses as a secure unlock. Like I don't know. I don't know that it does face unlock. I don't think that that was a thing that they talked about in the so, in the in the release. It might so still I use should, fingerprint, like the Pixel One, Two, and Three did. I should find the uh, Samsung article um, and put that in the news because I thought that was just funny. Okay. <laughs> you, you, do you know what I'm talking about? I maybe I do. I, I'm I'm drawing a blank at the moment. So the Galaxy S10 has okay. this this face unlock uh, system. Okay. And it works quite well until you put a uh, a, um, a case on it like a, a cover like a, uh -huh. just a you know a, a, just a, a plastic cover over the over you mean the a phone. screen protector screen protector yes that's yeah. what it is words are really hard right now <laughs> and <laughs> too the, much of that alcohol act, yeah the act of putting the the screen protector on it um <laughs> apparently um breaks face identification to the point where anybody can look at the phone and unlock it. Oh, that's neat. Isn't that neat? That, that's, yeah. That, that's a hell of a feature. That's a good feature. Yeah. That I'll a throw problem? that in the notes. Doesn't seem like a problem at all. <laughs> if you are concerned about security, it might be. <laughs> so anyway, since we've derailed the news pretty, pretty heftily here, uh, we're going to move on to the next article. This is from Forbes and I included it. Um, well, whatever. You can read the list and you'll see why I included it. Uh, the Global 2000, the world's best employers. Does it actually list 2,000 employers? Why does it say I Global 2000? Why don't you start scrolling page by page? I'm going, going to. Ad we, revenue we each have time and see if they do. We have to see. No. So the um, um, number three on this list is Red Hat, which is what I thought was, was great um, and why this came to my attention, mainly because Red Hat's never been included on this list before. I don't know what gets you included on the list. Like, I don't know what. What keys them off to uh, getting to bought by IBM. maybe that's this, it. Maybe getting bought this, by IBM is the way to get on this list. <laughs> this list is bullshit. Yeah. Yep. That only goes to 500. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why does it say 2000 then? 2000 must uh, mean something else. <laughs> I don't know. But it, it, interestingly, like things at the bottom of the list are just as fun. It's just as interesting as the top of the list. Oh yeah. Yeah. So number 500 is Deutsche Telekom. Okay. Uh, Four ninety nine is TD Bank. Um, Four ninety seven is J P Morgan Chase, and I actually know a couple people who work there, so I'll have to I'll have to tell them I'm, I, I feel for them. Yeah, they're at the bottom of the list. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of really well known companies at the bottom of the list. Well, I can Symantec, say that the ones Symantec is actually on the list. The ones at the top of this list really do seem to jive with the feeling I get from the industry. Number one is Alphabet, a.k.a. Google. Number two is Microsoft, which I guess after Bill Gates left has gotten better. Um, number, number three is Red Hat, which I can personally attest to, at least for a couple of weeks now, seems like a pretty damn good place to work. Um, yeah, that's and, why it's on this. That's why we have in this article. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, number four is Apple, which, again, I heard that it wasn't such a great place when Steve Jobs was still at the helm, or at least at a certain point in his career. Um, and then it goes on to things I have no real. Oh, number ten is Amazon. Okay, I, this this is total bullshit. Amazon shouldn't even be on this. <laughs> so it 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 depends on where you are in yeah. in the company. So you mean for Amazon? Um, for for a lot general? of these. Yeah. For a lot of these, I mean Amazon is a. Um, uh, from my understanding of people who've worked there. Um, as an engineer who works there or as like a software developer, it is, it is, you know, clearly top 10. Um, as somebody who works in the warehouse, uh, it sucks. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. My, my brother-in-law worked in a, worked in a warehouse for Amazon. Yeah. And he said the working yeah. conditions were horrible. The, the problem, the problem with some of these, um, Amazon being one of them and probably, I mean, I see like Costco wholesale, like I imagine they have warehouses too. The problem yeah, is mean, that some of these companies are so big that yeah. when you get to the, I don't, I don't want to call it outer edges, but I don't know what else to term it as. Like when you get to like the, the lower trenches of, of workers that are being paid the least. Like, yeah. So I mean, who, suck. like, who did they ask? How did they find out how great it was? 
Because if you ask the right people, every every company looks great. I was saying not to dunk on Forbes, but from my understanding, when they compile the billionaires list, they ask the billionaires how much they were worth. Right. Which, you know, led to some predictable results. Right. I'm not going near that one. <laughs> What's to go near? I'm not Already touching there. that one because I know exactly what you're talking about. And I'm not going anywhere near it. Nope. <laughs> next article. Okay, then. Next article. Uh, all right. So the next one's not really news. I included it. I mean, it is kind of news. I included it because it relates to an upcoming uh, show we're going to have. Uh, in fact, it could be our next show. Yeah, it is, isn't it? November. Yeah. The show after I'm back from Florida. Um, our first show in November. Uh, we're going to have uh, some representatives, I don't know who yet, uh, from Black Hills Information Security on the show to talk about their card game, Backdoors and Breaches, which uh, we, we both picked up copies of, Jason and I, at DerbyCon, along with a number of other people. Yeah, mine are like right there. I don't know if I can reach them. Ah. Right there. There's the cards. Backdoors and Breaches, right there, for anyone who is watching our audio podcast. <laughs> Say it with Brand me. Brand new shiny in the pack, never opened. Podcasting yeah. is a visual medium. Now, I, I actually opened mine to look at them, and we said we were going to try to get together to play a game, um, but this, this, uh, this link I've included in the show notes, or in the news section of the show notes, is a webcast that Black Hills, or John Strand himself actually, um, released from Black Hills about how to play Backdoors and Breaches. And now I can't get the cards back in the thing here. There we go. Um, so um, I'm probably going to watch it sometime between now and uh, when we have them on the show so I can have a better understanding of how the game works and whatnot because that might come up. And I recommend that everybody else watches it and then go try to get yourself a card deck because I'm pretty sure... They're either selling them or giving them away or whatever. And I, th I think you can still get them because they're pretty proud of this. And they should be. It seems like a really cool idea. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's very much into the – and they've been talking about this for a long time. Um, they're yeah. very much into uh, using a almost like a D&D &D mindset to do yeah. some of these uh, 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 exercises to, to teach how to deal yeah. with – um, you know, breaches and outages and, 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 and tabletop exercises in general. And it, it is, it is really cool. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I think, I think it's a great approach to it because it makes it into something. Um, I mean, th there's, I, I don't want to stereotype, <laughs> but there are a lot of nerds, a lot of people that work in it who are nerds who fondly remember, who Where? fondly remember playing tabletop games, whether they're card games or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever. Right. And the reason that those things are so attractive is that they can feel a whole lot like real situations where you get to work your way through a problem. So what better way to present an incident response scenario than to present it as a... I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm only in uh, three, four groups right now. So Yeah, unfortunately, I am in no gaming groups at the moment since I left the college because that was my only gaming group. Oh, what are you doing this weekend? Your character did die a glorious death. He did. He did. Destroying a dam. <laughs> what, what are you doing this weekend? Uh, not destroying a dam. <laughs> oh, uh, hit me up after the podcast. I uh, may have something going on. <clears throat> okay, then. Maybe I will. <laughs> so so related to, uh, related to this story, uh, slightly... Uh, if you're Google, um, John Strand is looking for you. He may have found something. Um, he's looking for your security <laughs> group. You may want to chat with him. Yeah. Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. And our last news article for the night, Unix co-founder. Oh, this is from Fossbytes. Unix co-founder Ken Thompson's BSD password finally cracked. And this is from October 11th. Wow. That's my, uh, I don't know. Should I say that on the podcast? No, I shouldn't. That is a significant date for me. I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, so apparently in the source tree for the BSD3 uh, code, I don't know if that's free BSD, BSD, whatever. 
uh, there was an Etsy password file that it, that contained a bunch of entries for a bunch of prominent names uh, in the Unix community. How they ended up there, I'm not really sure. It doesn't really say in the article, does it? But it lists who they were. Hang on. Does it have a list in this article? It was like Carnegie and Richie and Thompson. And Dennis Richie, else. Steve Bourne, Ken Thompson, Brian W. Kernigan. Yeah, that's the only ones it lists here. There may be more. I don't know. But those are the ones that it lists. Uh, and basically, uh, since, you know, hackers will be hackers, when they found this password file, they decided they were going to try to crack the passwords. And um, they found that Ken's password, they, they, they got... I guess many of them pretty quickly and easily, but they had some trouble cracking Ken's password. And that is because of the type of password that he used, which includes, uh, looks like all lowercase letters, but includes some numbers and some punctuation. So uh, it took a little longer to crack, as you might expect. Um, I think they said it was only a few days though, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, once they, once they ran it, um with the right, I guess, the right subset of, of characters that they're looking for, it, it went pretty quick. Um, yeah. And it's it's interesting. So so if you look at these, um, so for instance, uh, uh, Brian Kernigan, um, his password is basically um, the lower right-hand corner of your keyboard, starting with a slash, slash period, comma, uh, <laughs> slash period, comma. Nice. Uh, which, is, which is just a quick way to get into a system. So, you know, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, Eric, Eric Schmidt, who is the uh, executive chairman of, of Alphabet, um, Mr. Google himself, uh, his password was his wife's name, Wendy. Hmm. Um, and Stephen Bourne, who created Born Shell, um, his password was Born. And then you get to, why not? Then you get then you get to to Ken Thompson. Um, so. One of the things about Ken Thompson is that he also helped uh, write one of the first uh, chess, uh, the computer chess programs. Um, and it, as it turns out, his password is an opening move in chess. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and that, for whatever reason, was difficult for them to, to crack. Um, so I was trying to figure out, um, so they say that uh, this developer, uh, famous open source developer, Leia Newkirchen, um, and I probably butchered that, um, and I was trying to figure out who, like, who they were, and it, it looks like there's some sort of a Ruby developer, um, is my, my best guess here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, the, I, I haven't heard the name, so, but I'm also not a big Ruby person, so. So, but yeah, they, they finally cracked it. And that, that I think has taken care of all the passwords for that particular BSD uh, source code. Instance yeah, there's, there's a link here uh, that, to a, a, a mailing list um, post where they show all of the passwords. There's a couple funny ones in here. There's the... Yeah, there, there are some... There are slash some dot comma, slash dot comma. That's here. Born, FUBAR... APR 1744. I don't know. Is that a significant date? April 1744? Um, there was an explanation of that somewhere, and I don't remember what it was. I don't know why this sounds familiar. Axolotl. A-X-O-L-O-T-L. -O -O that rings a bell for me for some reason. I can't remember why. It is... Uh, if you look it up, there's a there's a... A Wikipedia entry for it. That's a Mexican walking fish. Hmm. It's a neotenic salamander. That still doesn't ring a bell, but I don't know. And I've heard that word before. I don't remember why. You, you gotta, you gotta go, you gotta go Google it because the pictures look fake. Oh yeah. Um, this is a real creature, but these things, this thing looks fake. Now this turns into the part of the show where we start googling random things and laughing at them. Axolotl. Doesn't look that fake. Are you saying this is a deep fake? Is that it? <laughs> I, that doesn't look like a like a cartoon to you. Not the Wikipedia page. No. Uh, maybe it's just the 
let's see, the Wikipedia page. Must be you not trusting the things you see on the internet. No, that, that first picture of a capsule of axolotl looks pretty fake. I don't know. Well, whatever. All right, so uh, then medium. there's 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 network, there's whatnot, there's dot 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 hello, um, Cheryl with a period. Wonder if that's another wife's name. Uh, this one this one got me. U U C P U U C P. I guess he likes okay. Unix to Unix Unix to Unix copy. Um, Jill and I. The only one in here that looks like it's decently uh, random. 5% GHJ uh, SN74193N. But anyway, it's a neat little article. Go ahead, read it. Fun stuff. Good stuff. And look up the axolotl and tell us if you think it looks fake. <laughs> Oh, and you, you included your link about the Galaxy S10 face unlock. I guess we don't have to talk about that again, do we? No, I mean, we could. We could. Let's you know, totally go back and talk about that time. again. Yeah, no, I think that's the end of the news. So, yeah. Um, good show tonight, I think. Even though we went all over the place. <laughs> Sorry for not going live like we usually do, but uh, hopefully you'll forgive us for that. So I guess we'll see you again in about two weeks. Um, we may or may not be live. <laughs> if, if people don't riot for this, uh, maybe, maybe this, this was more relaxed. I, I, liked, I liked not having to deal with, uh-oh, now Jason has a mech behind him. <laughs> oh, that's not good. No, not good at all. Everybody's looking for random information. If you try to purge 10,000 emails from your promotions category in Gmail, it starts getting a little huffy with you. It's weird. Listen. Don't they just don't they just spin up new data centers just to handle that for you? Yeah, they may absolutely. Spin up some extra data centers just to deal with what I was doing this evening. Yeah, cleaning up your I'm Gmail listening. inbox. I'm trying to get it to the point where every incoming mail is labeled. I'm getting close. Every single one, huh? Yep. Good. I mean, obviously, if it's somebody new or some new thing, then. Do you do you have a catch all that just says like this is the label that catches everything? <laughs> Cuz that's how I would do it. Now it's done. Everything's labeled. <laughs> it's useless yeah, but no, it's labeled. Th th yeah, that would be that would <laughs> defeat the purpose. Of that would defeat the purpose. Categorizing the mail. <laughs> So at any rate, uh, if you want to watch us live, presuming that we keep doing that, it'll be the second and fourth Thursday of every month, unless we can't do it for some reason. Uh, you can do that on YouTube, youtube.com slash ironsysadminpodcast. Uh, if you want to chat with us on a somewhat regular basis, you can go do that via Slack. Go to ironsysadmin.com forward slash Slack for a Slack invitation that'll get you right to our Slack workspace or whatever they're calling them now. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Just look for Iron Sysadmin. Uh, you can subscribe to us wherever you normally get podcasts, uh, including Stitcher. Not Stitcher. What was the one I just added us to? Spotify, including Spotify now, which I got confirmation from the person who'd asked about that. And they said it is working well. So you can get us on Spotify now. Um, and don't forget, like I mentioned earlier in the show, you can contribute to the show monetarily via Patreon. Patreon.com slash Iron And that, I think, is a wrap for tonight's show. You guys have any final thoughts? Uh, I like turtles. There's a mech behind you. It's okay. It's okay. The pilot is on top of the mech, so I think you're safe. It's also not facing you. He's just showing off. He's just showing. He's standing. He wants a, he wants a better view, so he stands on top of his mech. And anyone who has no idea what we're talking about, you're just going to have to go see if I posted this on YouTube so you can tell why Jason has a mech behind him. Well, it's not going to say why. You'll just be able to see the mech. Why we're talking about a mech behind Jason. How's that? That works a little better. <laughs> All right, folks. So that's it for tonight. Have a good one. All right, folks. You guys can say good night now before I push the button. Give it only a second. Ah! Push the button.